All right, everyone, I want to welcome you out to the DC Cybersecurity Professionals Meetup Group, well, the virtual meetup group because of COVID. I, I am Tyrone E. Wilson, the CEO and founder of Cover Six Solutions. We organize the meetup group, uh, the DC Cyber Warriors. We're over 8,000 people right now. We are attempting something new this year, and that is to give a presentation every Thursday. So follow us on meetup.com slash DC Cyber Warriors or on the Cover Six Solutions uh, YouTube channel. We have a playlist called the Virtual Meetups. So follow that playlist. You will learn something new every week. I can guarantee it. Also check out some of the past speakers. We've had some really, really, really good speakers. Also, we have a really good one coming up next week uh, with Alyssa Miller. It's called um, F You Pay Me, knowing, what, knowing your worth. And that's gonna be really good for those trying to identify you know, um, tips to negotiate salaries. So I wanna welcome Juan, and I wanna say thank you for coming out. Um, you are in a different time zone. Juan's in Spain right now, so we're really happy to have you. And with that being said, um, we're going to talk about the browser exploitation framework and social engineering. So Juan, take it over. All right. So thank you very much, uh, Tyron, for this opportunity. So let me try to start, you know, share information about the browser exploitation framework, about how to use some social engineering techniques to, uh, you know, to take control of the browser of the victim. So a little bit about me, my name is Juan Araya. I'm from Costa Rica. Right now I live in Spain. I have almost two years living, living in Spain. I'm a cloud security specialist. I have a master degree in cybersecurity and also earned several uh, cybersecurity related certifications such as the CompTIA, CAS, and PENTES, and uh, Certified Security Analyst and Security Plus. I'm now trying to get more and more um, specialized in cloud. For example, I already, I passed just a few weeks ago, the AWS Cloud Practitioner, the Aviatrix, and in my pipeline, uh, very soon I'm gonna try to take the AWS um, SA Architect, you know, Solution Architect, and then of course the AWS uh, Security. So little by little, that's a little bit about, about my background. Feel free to add me as a contact on LinkedIn and follow me on Twitter if you want. I'm always sharing information about cybersecurity, so feel free to contact me. This is a, an honor to be, for me to be down here sharing this information. So what, I'm, what I'll be talking about, I'll be talking about this a specific topic. So first of all, I'll provide a quick introduction about you know, the current landscape, about the, the some trends that are, that are pretty interesting. Then I'll talk about what is social engineering and why it is so important to know uh, how to use it. It then about penetration testing and how you can combine social engineering with penetration testing. I'm going to try to focus on one of the many tools. In this case, it's going to be the browser exploitation framework. This is a very interesting tool that would enable us to execute a JavaScript that is going to hook the browser of the victim. And that way, we will be able to bypass all the security, right? All the perimeter is going to, is going to be, it's not going to be any more anymore a roadblock because we're going to have we are going to be able to access a browser that is already inside the network of the company where we are doing a penetration testing and then of course if the users are not very uh, aware aware of cybersecurity attacks and social engineering then most likely you will be able to trick really easily you know the employees and co take control of the browser of the victim then we will know about the uh, actual architecture. You will see something uh, that for me caught my attention that is extremely simple, the architecture. We're talking about a JavaScript. We're talking about a database. It also has some APIs that you can consume. You will learn about the hook and process, which is very, very simple. It contains a part that is related with social engineering. And of course, a, a technical part where you will be integrating Beef with Metaxploit to send payloads and execute um, some specific attacks. And finally, I'll show you some example of how you can use um, the browser exploitation framework and some uh, social engineering tools to perform your different um, security assessments. 
So a little bit about the trends and how this has been changing. So for those that are a little bit old like me, uh, in my times when I used to connect to the internet, I used to have used to use in this case a uh, 56 kilobit per second a uh, modem that used to make a funny noise. You know when it, it used to connect to the internet with a very slow uh, speed, um, no, not readable connection. Uh, at that time, we were talking about the 90s around that. You know, the browser that was available, as you can see, was Netscape. This company, uh, this browser doesn't exist anymore. So it's pretty interesting how at that time, uh, those were the first steps related with uh, access to, the, to technology and access to the internet. At that time, talking about being able to uh, see videos on real time to perform a streaming of audio and video, that was basically sci-fi. If Someone said that at that time, he will say, man, you're crazy, that, that, that is not possible. But nowadays it is possible. And nowadays it is pretty interesting to see how it has been changing. For example, if you go to this website, you will be able to obtain a lot of information and pretty interesting about the current status. Here we can see that it's no longer a sci-fi thing. You know, the fact that the internet is fast and accessible. Here we can see just a snapshot about how many websites are right now are available, how many emails are being sent, how many tweets has been posted, Google search, um, you know, the uses of social media uh, websites, even phone calls, and pretty interesting how many websites has been hacked at this moment, just today, just in one day. So it's always interesting to see how this is been changing and will continue changing. And regarding trends. So what is the, the current trend? The current trend is that nowadays we are allowing our employees to be able to access a, from different devices to the internet. We are a, accessing using mobile devices, using a, tablets as an example, a, laptops. Also something that is pretty interesting from the trend perspective is how the gaming industry is changing. A few years ago, you used to play alone, you know, with, you, with your Nintendo. Nowadays you are playing online with people from all around the world. I, and of course, you know, the, the technology is changing now with the virtual reality and um, th those type of uh, technologies. It is even more and more interesting the way it is changing, the way we are consuming the, the services of these type of industries. With the IoTs is also changing. We're talking about devices that enable us to control, you know, the alarm of the house, the devices that are able to control the illumination of your, the lighting of your, of your house. And even a, another trend that is kind of interesting nowadays will be the connected cars and autonomous systems. Now we're talking about cars that are no longer a, just a device that enable us to a, move from one place to another. It's a device that tell us in real time the status of, of the vehicle. And some of them, in this case, the autonomous cars are able even to drive you know, without um, a driver in front of it. Now, the technology, as you saw, give us a lot of benefits. It's pretty interesting. It's, it's every time it's faster, but it's not secure because it's not designed from security from day one. So that's why attackers are always trying to affect the CIA. In other words, the confidentiality, the integrity, and the availability of the data. Every time they're trying to uh, inject malware, they're trying to fool us to um, execute payloads. They're trying to steal information, you know, patent, patents. They're trying to steal confident data uh, PII information that they could resell in the deep web. They are trying to um, take take down web servers, you know, by performing denial of service attacks. They are trying to take control of your computer by fooling you to execute, you know, malware in this case ransomware. And if and only if you pay, then in theory they will release your defaults from you again. Of course, it's not a good idea to pay, but that is what they are trying to do. And of course, information leakage. When a company is has is impacted by information leakage, there are many consequences, and one of them is the, the failure or the negative impact on the reputation of the company. Uh, as an example, if you have a, if your bank is being impacted, most likely you will not feel comfortable and confident that your money is in a secure place. So the reputation of the bank will be so affected that many customers will take down will take out you know all their money and go to the competitors. So those are just in a very high level, some of the current trends and current, current threats that are affecting it nowadays. 
So what is this social engineering and how it is so important? So first of all, social engineering is a way to manipulate people. It's a way to um, try to force people to do something that they will normally not do under normal circumstances. So for example, people, if you ask for a password to a person, most likely they will say, you know what? No. However, if you use the proper technique to manipulate the person, for example, making making the person the person feel that if they don't do it, there is going to be some negative consequence. We can make them feel that it's urgent, that it, we need that to be performed immediately, fast. We need to we can make them feel that there's a, you know everybody's doing it, so it's okay. It's it's there's no issue with that. So as you can see, those are very, very, very simple examples about how you can try to manipulate a person. So social engineering is that it's a way to um, hack the behavior of the, of the person or, or people to do something that they would normally not do. And why do they do it? Why do attackers use social engineering? They will use social engineering to steal information. They, they, they are looking for usernames. They are looking for passwords. They are looking for sensitive data, such as, as an example, IP addresses, backend technology. They want to know a credit, ca credit card numbers. They want to know back, bank account numbers and so on to steal data and, of course, monetize that effort. So how do they do it? So these are some of the most um, common te techniques that are used. The first one is known as authority. Basically, the attacker is going to try to fool the victim, make them make them, them think that, that the person that is attacking them has the authority to ask for something, to, uh, uh, you know, has the authority and that they have to do it. Simple as that, you know. Uh, the intimidation will be, for example, that they are trying to ask for something that if you don't help them, then there's going to be some negative consequences. You're going to be fired. There's going to be, someone is going to be on, on jeopardy, right? The consensus is, as for example, you tell them, you know, everybody from your team already shared this information with us. Please share, share it as soon as possible. So it seems that it is okay because everybody already did it, right? And the scarcity is, for example, that when they tell you, hey, this is the last offer. Just for, just today, if we have the last three iPhones that we are ready to to just uh, uh, give as a as a gift. So the scarcity is to make them feel that they it's a it's a bargain. It's it's an opportunity that you take need to take advantage of. Familiarity. This is a very interesting one because in this case the attacker is going to try to uh, study the victim. They are going to try to make them feel that they already know this person. So how can how can that happen? For example, if someone is able to analyze the Facebook profile of a victim. They will know what type of sports most likely they, they want. They will they will know to which places they want to they like to go. They they will know even their political position, you know, um, they have a lot of things. Where where did they study? What did they study? Where do they work? So once they once they analyze all this information, they will have a profile of the victim and then they can use this information to make the victim feel that it they already know this person. And the goal will be to earn their trust. Once the trust has been earned, the attacker is gonna to try to ask for information or for actions to be performed. And finally, it will be uh, try to apply some sort of sense of urgency. You know, tell them, hey, this is really urgent, this is important, um, I'm the CEO, I'm outside of the office and I need you to uh, perform a wire transfer in the next five minutes because this is a business that, that I need to perform right now. You see, so you, you will make, you will add some pressure on the victim from the timing perspective. So this is an example about a, one of the many techniques that are being used a, using social engineering. In this case, this is phishing. On this technique, they are sending a lot of emails, a lot of a, different communications that are designed to try to fool the victim. For example, they are gonna add some subject in the email that is going to be catchy. It's going to have a name. It's going to it's going to be brief, but it's going to be a, something that is going to is designed to uh, catch the attention of the victim. Then uh, they will add some uh, uh, pretexting. In this in this case, they will add some text designed to try to fool the victim. In this case, they are talking about um, get an affordable health uh, coverage. They are going to give you three links. However, even when these links are supposed to go to, to some sort of insurance company, of course, it's not, that's not going to be the case. They are gonna, these links are going to 
pointing to some websites that most likely will be malware already uh, available to be downloaded. And after that, as you know, uh, malware could be installed and executed on the victim uh, computer. So some people will say, but how this is so uh, efficient? Because, uh, I mean, people should, should, should be more careful with this. Well, it's very simple. You know, a, every day we are living in a fast paced life. You know, people are receiving a lot of emails. People don't pay attention to details. People just read real quick. Some, they perform some sort, of, some sort of scheming. They just see the subject, they just see the text and they think, okay, this seems to be legitimate. You see, they don't have that, um, that attitude that now, so of course, cybersecurity specialists, we do, you know, we, we keep an eye on the, all those details. We check email headers we, because we know that, that that is a way to per check if that email is legitimate or not. But most of the people, they, are, they don't have that technical expertise and even knowledge. So they, they will just believe, you know, that those type of emails are, um, are legitimate. And of course, they are, the, the attackers are using, are always reading the news. They are trying to try to fool the attacker and try to make them feel that this is a legitimate email. So as an example, this is from the World Health Organization. They are taking advantage of the coronavirus um, uh, disaster that we are facing worldwide. And they design a very good free texting. You know, they are, this is a text that is designed to uh, make them, to make the people that receive this email think that this is a legitimate email. They talk about the coronavirus. They, they talk about uh, some sort of ebook. So you see, and there's also an attachment. Again, most of the people will not keep, uh, keep an eye on those details. But for example, why an attachment? Why are we going to receive a, a zip file with an attachment? Uh, most people would just see, for example, the name of the uh, uh, sender, but they will not check. For example, if you reply, who will be uh, the destination uh, email? Um, you know, the one that is going to receive the email. If that doesn't match, that, that definitely is a, a possible indicator of that something is wrong. So... Um, this is an, another example. And once again, related with coronavirus, they are always trying to perform, they are always trying to re register many fake uh, websites. These are, this is just a snapshot of some possible fake websites that you can even download on this um, URL because they are always trying to perform some sort of type of squatting. You know, some of these websites, you know, domains that we are seeing down here might be legitimate, but some of them might be very similar to the legitimate website that is type of squatting. So they try to do, they try to even register domains that looks very similar to the official website. And that way, when someone click on that, they will think that they are, they are, they are accessing the proper website when they are not. And of course they try to, uh, uh, inject, you know, fake news continually. Uh, people think that uh, easy money is good. Unfortunately, that's not the case. You know, of course, Mark Zuckerberg is not going to give you four that five million dollars uh, just because, just because you have you're using Facebook. Of course not. Uh, some of them are are uh, always also uh, reading the news and they are also knowing about, you know, for example, latest threats related with malware, and they try to impersonate that they are an antivirus company, that they are a cybersecurity company, and they might send emails, um, making the feel, feel the possible victim feels that if they do this, you know, if they download this um, security fix, as an example, or hot fix, that is going to avoid your computer to get uh, infected. But of course, that's not the case. That uh, attachment is not an antivirus. You know, that attachment is an actual virus, as an example. So we need to be very, very careful because attackers using social engineering are trying to take advantage of, of the fact that people doesn't, um, they, they, they trust a lot. They doesn't uh, think twice before clicking, you know, most of the time. And emails is not the only way to use social engineering to make attacks. There are also other techniques, for example, SMS smishing. You know, in this case, they are, they are sending text messages using um, a tool such as WhatsApp, Telegram. They are using, of course, a, a SMS, you know, text messages from, a, from mobile a devices. They are able to even perform some sort of spoofing from the a, uh, phone number. So you might think 
that the SMS message that you just received is from the actual bank because the phone number seems to be from the bank, but that is not the case. There are tools designed for that. And another way to perform social engineering, engineering is known as vision. In this case, it's by phone call. So someone is gonna perform a phone call, is gonna impersonate maybe a, someone from upper management, is gonna try to start forcing or asking for some specific action. And again, they can use, for example, the intimidation uh, technique. They could say uh, that if, if you don't execute that action item, of course, that is gonna, that could impact, I don't know, the uh, safety of the employees, people could get fired. So that's why we need that action item to be performed fast and now. So that, that would be phishing, you know, when you're using your voice to impersonate someone and to use social engineering techniques. Now, penetration testing. So this is the other part. So first we need to understand what is social engineering, what are the risks, how it is performed. Now, penetration testing is a simulated attack. It's an effort that we are going to perform to simulate what will happen if someone is trying to attack our website, if someone is trying to attack our um, network. So basically here, we need to be very careful when we're doing a penetration testing, we need to make sure that we follow an ethical hacking approach. Remember that the idea is to simulate an attack to document what will happen in the worst case scenario. Um, so, and this is totally different from a vulnerability scanning. A vulnerability scan is an automatic, automatic, autom automatic test that is performed, you know, using a tool such as Qualys or Acutinex or any other, right? That at the end will give you at the end just a, an automatic report. A penetration testing is when you're gonna have a security expert, you know, executing um, those attacks to try to explode those vulnerabilities that has been discovered. And how those vulnerabilities are discovered, there are three possible scenarios. For example, when they hire you for a black box penetration testing, that means that you will have no information about the target. They will just tell you, I want you to perform a penetration testing against my company, that's all. They will not give you IP addresses, they will not give you backend information, no, no credentials, nothing. Some companies might give you some data to make the penetration testing even faster and easier, that, that is known as a great box penetration testing. So you will be able to start, you know, if, um, from day one with more information compared to the black box pen testing. So with the great box, you will be able to start, you know, uh, trying to explode some of the vulnerabilities that has been already shared uh, by the customer. For example, they tell you that they are using, I don't know, a web server, an IIS a web server version X. So you can easily research and know what type of vulnerabilities are present if you're using that specific version of web server. And finally, it will be a white box penetration testing where basically they are gonna give you all the information that you want, that you need. Of course, in these three types of penetration testing, there's one data that is extremely important, which is the contract. The contract needs to uh, identify in black and white exactly what you are allowed to do. What is the outcome, the expected outcome? What is the objective, right? Uh, and please, when you do a penetration testing, be very careful to respect the scope of your penetration testing. Okay, don't do more than what has been requested, but because you could be, you could be, you could have a legal, you know, issue if you do it. So make sure to just perform a penetration testing if and only if you have a contract that is a very clear. And depending on the type of penetration testing, then you will have some information that will make your life easier during the um, vulnerability assessment and security assessment. Now, which are the phases? The phases are extremely easy. So the first one would be a planning and reconnaissance. Again, planning, as, as you saw down there, I'm highlighting it, highlighting it in red. Why? Because the planning section will be when you are uh, trying to define the scope, when you know what type of penetration testing you're going to be performing, what you're going to be allowed to do, what you're not going to be allowed to do. And once you know that, then you're going to start uh, analyzing your target, analyzing your victim. So for example, if someone hire you to perform penetration testing of the network of a specific company, and you want to use also social engineering, you can, during the reconnaissance, you will be uh, trying to gather information about who work on that company, what type of email address are, are available, um, 
who, uh, what are their interests. So you will start gathering information that will be useful for the next phases. On the threat modeling, you're going to be identifying, okay, what type of vulnerabilities are present? What type of attacks could be performed, right? And then the third one, you are going to be a, analyzing based on the vulnerability assessment that, that was performed, which are the best weapons that will be useful for you to exploit those vulnerabilities. So, uh, of course, once you define your weapons, you need to send the different payloads and hopefully those payloads are being executed and that's the exploitation phase uh, where, for example, the goal would be to try to ask someone to double click on, a, on an attachment and that attachment is going to uh, op open up a backdoor. So you will be able to have shell access. So that will be the exploitation. You finally have access to shell on the target computer. And once you have access to shell, you know, of course, you can do, uh, depending on your penetration testing, you can try to do pivoting. You can try to uh, extract data. You can try to perform escalation privilege, whatever it is on your penetration testing, on the scope of your penetration testing. On the post-exploitation, the idea is to try uh, two things. Try to keep a uh, persistence. Right? You can create your own backdoors in case you need to continue your penetration testing later on. And, and once you complete your penetration testing, you need to perform two action items. Number one, make sure that you are documenting all your findings because at the end you have to create a report to run penetration testing. Without the report, there's no payment. So make sure to do a very good reporting and then to remove your tracks, you know. So, uh, Make sure that you leave everything as the way it was before you were uh, trying to perform your penetration test. So these are in high level, the different phases during the penetration testing. Now with BIF, with the browser exploitation framework that I'm gonna mention in a few minutes, the goal will be to try to bypass all the security uh, that a company has just by fooling someone that is already working inside the network of your target um, company. So even when the company has the biggest and the most expensive firewall, even, even if they have EDRs, even if they have antivirus, even if they have uh, denial of service protection, even if they have a, an IDS, an IPS, whatever they have, right? If the victim is um, accessing a website that is running, um, in this case, a hook in JavaScript, then you will be able to control the browser of a computer that is already inside the network. So that will open up, you know, the Pandora box. Uh, it will give a lot of um, possible uh, attack surface that you can exploit. So what is this browser exploitation framework? So first of all, if you go to this link to the browser exploitation framework uh, .com, you will be able to know a lot of ab about this project. It's an open source um, project that enables us to take control of different browsers. So once an, a person access a, uh, access a website that is running on a specific JavaScript that is able to perform hooking process, then you will be able to perform reconnaissance uh, of the uh, target uh, operating system, of the target browser. You will know the version. You will know um, if it is a 64-bit computer, 32-bit computer. You will be able to obtain a lot of data. And of course, you will be able to send the specific payloads that will be executed on the victim co uh, computer. So this project was created initially using PHP and then it was migrated to Ruby in the early, about almost about one year ago, the installation process was a little bit more um, uncomfortable. Nowadays it's extremely easy and you're gonna see it shortly um, because there's a, a an option that is gonna install all the prerequisites for you right away. It's extremely, extremely easy to use. Now, this is the look and feel of the dashboard. Basically, it says, for example, you will be able to know which browsers uh, are online. In other words, which of the victims that are, are right now accessing the website that has the uh, JavaScript. And you can also obtain information about those victims that uh, in some point of time, they um, access the website that has the hook in JavaScript. This project was initially designed by Wade A. Alcorn. You can see a, his profile down here on LinkedIn. He works on Alcorn a Group in Australia. 
and this is his book, you know, The Browser Hacker's Handbook, in case you want to learn more about the, this a very interesting project, the Browser Exploitation Framework. So when you access this uh, website, you will uh, obtain information about what is this framework. You will be able to even download the source code because it's an open source uh, project. Uh, a lot of documentation. If you see any improvement areas, you can even share those improvement areas. And if you want to contribute to, even, to do it even better, you can do it. Now, what type of attacks can you perform? With the browser exploitation framework, you can try to perform different type of attacks. The first one would be hooking, where basically in the hooking process, you will take control of the browser of the victim. And once you do it, you will be able to perform fingerprinting. You will know about the operating system, the browser version. You will know a lot of information about the uh, what extensions are installed, uh, for example. Then you will be able to send a uh, payloads. You will be able to exploit them to discover vulnerabilities. And of course, it uh, performs uh, use social engineering to fool the, the victim. For example, you can um, send a specific message to appear on the browser of the victim that looks like a new plugin or a message, a legitimate message from Firefox where it is not. So that will be some phishing uh, examples. And of course, now we're, because we're talking about phishing, uh, we can use the browser exploitation framework to also perform some layer seven attacks. And one of them could be a cross site scripting attack. So that is pretty interesting. Um, and again, that opens up the opportunity to perform in not only basic attacks, but also some more advanced attacks. The architecture is extremely simple. The architecture, you can see down here, it, it is composed of database, in this case, a SQLite database. It, con it has some uh, configuration files, in this case, some config.yaml files. It uses some command uh, JavaScript uh, file. And of course, uh, the code is developed using Ruby. So that's why you have a backend Ruby class on the module.rb file. And if you want, if you want to interact in, in an automatic fashion or programmatic fashion, you can also use the BIF API. This is the general structure. The hacker and also the user, they will be interacting with a web server that has a website that has been compromised and that is running a, a JavaScript, and a specific JavaScript. That JavaScript, as you can see, that, that's the JavaScript hook. That is the one that is going to be sending information in real time to the a, a, a Beef server about a browsers that fail you know on on the on the trick a browsers that uh, bite the dust you know and are hooked at that moment it also uh, has access to a database where you can obtain information about the different um, the different exploits that are ready to be executed and the different type of commands that you can send against the victim and I mentioned also if you want to do it you know via API there are some apis that are going to uh, automate, for example, the authentication process, the fingerprinting, checking logs, and uh, launch different commands. This is just an example about how the API, the use of the API looks like. You are going to use a token. You are going to specify which is a, the BIF server. And of course, the, um, the port that is going to be used. In this case, port 3000 is the default, but it's not the only one. You can also customize it. And once you start using a, the browser exploitation framework, you can combine it using Metaxploit, and that is going to be very interesting because now you are not only able to hook the browser of the victim, but now you can also send payloads. Now you can also try to open up a, a reverse shell, as an example. So this is where it gets even more interesting. The hooking process is extremely simple. So number one, we need to try to fool the victim to go to a website, and that website needs to be running on a specific JavaScript. That JavaScript is going to uh, connect to the BIF server. And that way, once the person access the website, then uh, the, the BIF server is going to uh, get notified in real time. And at that moment, you will be able to start the fingerprinting process and the attack process. So when you install BIF, you will know that uh, you will see the actual JavaScript that I was mentioning, the hook.js. It will also have an administration panel, an administration GUI, so you can uh, manage it. 
And if you don't want to, if you want to do it, you know, via API, here you will find your API key for the RESTful API. The graphic user interface is extremely simple. It will have for a, a default login page. The default um, username and password will be beef, but of course, when you install it, you will have to change it at your credentials. And this is the um, the main page. You will see the information about the browsers that has been that are online right now, the ones that are offline right now, a quick introduction about the project. And once you select on one of the possible victims, this menu will change because once that happens, you will be able to see the details of the browser. You will be able to select the commands. You will be able to check the logs and so on. And this is what I was mentioning. For example, I'm selecting this specific uh, computer. And now I can see that is, this computer is running Firefox, the version 15. I can see, I can parse the user agent and obtain, you know, the Mozilla 5.0. I can obtain information about plugins that are already installed, right? If it is able, if Java is enabled on that browser, if JavaScript is enabled, and so on. So many, many data from the fingerprinter perspective, which is a first step, you know, on, on a penetration testing process where you are going to be performing some reconnaissance. Now, when you're using the BIF a graphic user interface, there's a section that says commands. On that section is where you're going to select your different attacks to try to take control of the browser of the victim. Now, there are some that are already predefined and it all and each and every one of these possible attacks that you can try to execute, they, they use a color coding and this is the color coding. The green means that that attack is present, that vulnerability is present and you can try to explode it. And it's going to be invisible. In other words, the victim is not going to see any pop-up. They are going to see. They are not going to see any anything on their computer. It's for them. Nothing is happening. But we know that those commands are being executed. If it is in orange, it means that yeah, it's going to work. But most likely, the victim is going to see something. It's going to be a pop. They are going to see a pop-up. They are going to see I don't know a common line, and so on. The gray it means that we don't know. We don't know if that um, attack is going to work. You need to check it out. And if it is on red, it will not, don't lose your time because it's not gonna work, you know. And of course, it, it, the color coding will, will be different depending on the browser of the victim and how updated is the browser and many other factors. So not all the um, commands that, that are available will work when you try to perform a penetration test in using Brief. Now the installation is extremely simple. For example, if you're using Kali Linux 2020.3 or 2020.4, first make sure that your Kali Linux machine is up to date. So just perform, you know, the sudo apt-get update and the sudo apt-get uh, upgrade before installing uh, PIF. Then uh, download the project. In this case, you know, using git clone. Then go to the actual folder, cd PIF. This you're gonna see the folder. Make sure to install. That's why I was saying that right now it's a lot easier and faster to do it. Ch make sure to change your default credentials to yaml.config file. It, this, there are two yaml.configs, one that is inside the BIF folder and another one that is inside BIF extensions, meta exploit. You're gonna find another one named uh, yaml.config. On the first one, it, this is gonna be the username and password to access the BIF administration um, console. And the second one will be to be able to interact with Metaxploit. Okay, so just make, to, make sure to enable it and to change the use, default username and password. And this is where you're changing the default username and password of the Metaxploit extension uh, on this uh, config.jml file. Then after that, make sure to update the geo database and the browser exploitation uh, framework web server. These are the commands sudo that uh, slash a uh, update that beef and the other one is basically that slash update that geo IP database. Then in order to make sure to be able to use Metaxploit, you need to enable the RPC communication. In order to do it, it's very simple. Just go, you know, start the Metaxploit, then type load MSG a RPC server host. Make sure to add down here the IP address of your uh, server. 
the username and password that you set on your second uh, config.yaml, the one that is inside extensions meta exploit. And that's it. Yeah. Now you, your PIF is going to be able to use meta exploit and load all the different payloads. Finally, make sure to start your BIF uh, project. It's just go to your folder, type dash slash BIF, and it will start the, the project. Um, you know, just authenticate, use your username and password, and that's it. You know, this is gonna be the default website that you're gonna see when you install BIF for the first time. Now, just as an example, let's see what, we, what you can do with the browser exploitation framework. So for example, if you try to do it, the first thing that I will suggest is to try to perform the reconnaissance of possible victims, because the idea is to try to fool someone. So one possible tool that you can do, that you can use would be um, the Harvester using OSIN, open source intelligence. So for example, you are gonna type, you know, the Harvester slash D, the domain of the company that asks you to perform a penetration testing, uh, obtain information about people that work on that company, filter by LinkedIn, you know, as a, as a source of data. Then it will give you a lot of information about possible email addresses that you can use to try to impersonate. Then prepare your bait. So in this case, you're gonna, the, the goal is to obtain even more information about the victim. If you want to perform some sort of a spear phishing, in other words, try to perform a phishing attack against a specific group of people, or a, so in that case, you know, try to obtain more information about them. A Maltego is a very good source, you know, just add the domain or you can, you can start the research by email address and little by little, you will know more about the victim. Of course, the Maltego, there are two versions. The free version will give you some general data, but if you're able to pay for the enterprise version, that will be even better. We'll give you more details about your possible victim. Then you can also use social scan. This is another tool that uh, will give you more information about uh, which accounts that victim has also on social media websites, such as uh, Spotify, Twitter, um, Facebook, and many others. And now, the, this is one of the most critical sections. Define a the text that you're gonna be sending to the victim. That is pre-texting. So make sure that it's catchy, that something that catches the attention of the victim. You can use any of the, te the techniques that I mentioned, like a scarcity, urgency, familiarity. The quid pro quo, that means that, um, for example, you are, you're gonna make the, the victim feel that if they do something, they will receive something, right? So that's the quid pro quo. Make sure to select a very interesting subject, that the body looks good, you know, use a, a HTML format, you know, in other words, use the colors, add pictures, you know, to look as a, as legitimate as possible. The hyperlinks, you can use some techniques to try to hide the, the real IP or the real URL. You can use tiny URL. You can you can change the the display hyperlink text to be a to look legitimate, but of course the URL is gonna be totally different. And of course, you can use ngrok and you can use other techniques to try to hide your um, your uh, domain. So this is just an example. If you uh, are analyzing a victim and you, after analyzing the social media, you know that this guy likes to do some mountain bike, so you can do that pretexting based on a possible a bargain of a um, mountain bike. So you see, 45% of the of your mountain bike um, computer just during this weekend. Click here. Now, in order to prepare the hook, first of all, if you just use the default website that Beef sent you, most likely would not work. You need to do a little bit more. You need to um, create your own website or clone an existing website and then replace it, right? So for example, I'm trying to, uh, I clone a website using this social engineering toolkit. There's an option down there to clone websites. Then I, I copy all the HTML files inside the um, path that is being used by the BIF uh, browser. So that way, when someone access my BIF server, they're gonna see this uh, better looking website related with mountain bike. Now, how can you expose your web server? So you can do it in several ways. One of them could be by using ngrok and, uh, and try to use tinyurl to hide the, and to give less details to the, to the possible victim. Or you can use some type of squatting in other words, go to GoDaddy or any website, 
any register. Register are a domain that looks very similar to the to a legitimate website you know, that is known as type squaring, and try to redirect that domain to your ngrok uh, web server. Now, how you can send the message to your possible victims? You can use the social engineering toolkit. You, if you go to this section, you're gonna see a, on the social engineering toolkit that is available on Kali Linux. If you go to the um, social engineering attacks and then you select the option five, which is the mass email, a mass mailer attack, and then select if you want to send this uh, fake email to one person or to multiple um, victims, you can do it easily. You can use your own um, a SMTP server or you can um, configure a Gmail account easily and use Gmail as your web server, as your email server to send those fake notifications. Or if you don't want to use Gmail or if you don't want to hire an SMTP server or you don't want to configure your, your own SMTP server, a very easy way will be just to install mail utils and use post fix to send those uh, emails from your computer. So this is the idea. The idea is that we, uh, we just create the domain. We have every, your BIF browser is, uh, your BIF server is ready and you already send the email notification to the possible victims. So when, the, when someone, uh, the idea is that we are going to send this email to multiple victims. They are going to click on a hyperlink that is going to be on the body of the email as an example, and then they're going to access this website. When they access the web, this website, we're going to take control of that. So these are going to be some things that we could do. For example, when the victim clicks on the website, we are going to know in real time that someone click on, click on it. Okay. So the first step, do some fi fingerprinting, some reconnaissance, know as much as you can about the victim, what browser they're using, what um, operating system they're using, um, what versions are installed, what plugins are installed. So try to obtain as much data as possible. Then once you do that, you will, you will be able to start playing around. If you go to the command section, you will see many, many possible attacks that you could perform. I'm just selecting three very basic ones. The first one is going to be a redirection attack. So the idea is that we are going to make the browser to redirect, you know, to load another website, any website that we want after they access the website that is running the uh, hook JavaScript. So as an example, I'm going to, I'm going to force the web server of the victim to load another website. You can add anyone. And of course, this um, URL could be a malicious URL, it could have malware, it could have uh, anything that you want. When the person, um, when that redirection is performed, you're gonna know on real time if it was executed properly. And you can see down here that according to the results, it was redirected to the website that I, that I specify. So that's why I typed on there, redirection perform. It takes just a few seconds and you're gonna see that redirection is performed without any issue. So tap navin. So this is another type of attack that you can perform because most of most of the people have a very bad practice. That, that practice is the fact that they normally have multiple tabs open. They don't close the sessions. So they start checking their e personal email and then they open up another tab and they start, a, I don't know, checking Netflix or checking Amazon or eBay, whatever they want. And they don't close these sessions. So those sessions are still a, up and running. So you could do a lot of things. You could try to perform a cross site scripting forgery attack, you know, to try to take take control of a of a session that is open. You can use this tap navin. And what is this tap navin? This tap navin, the idea is to try to uh, when the person is um, open up another tab in the browser, and he, for example, decide to see a movie on Netflix, but forgot to close his session of the online banking. So we can. Uh, tell the system to redirect to another website on the tab that is not active. So the victim is not gonna know uh, that um, that redirection is performed because most likely the guy is watching that Netflix movie uh, on full screen. So he will not realize that that is happening. Just as an example, I'm putting them here that someone is gonna try the redirection is gonna be performed when the tab is not active to a, a website where you can download a malware. And when the, if you start checking it out, you will see that in this case, at this specific time frame, the tab 
um, become inactive. So when that tab become inactive, it's going to be triggered. And we can see it down here. So it became inactive and it was redirected successfully. And once it is redirected successfully, unfortunately, that redirection could force the browser to download malware or to do whatever you want. Another thing that you can do is to try to send a payload. An easy way to send a payload is to use this um, fake notification bar. So first, of course, you need to create, to select or generate your own payload. You can use Metaxploit, you can use VS Menem, you can use the Social Engineering Toolkit. You can upload that payload to a specific section on your folder and then make a reference of that section uh, using this uh, option, URL, uh, plugin URL. So what is the idea? The victim is gonna see this. It's gonna see a message that says an additional plugin is required to display some elements on this page. Again, most of, the, most of the people, they will not check it out and they will just click install plugin. They, they think this is legitimate because this appears to be part of the, you know, a plugin that is required. So however, it's a fake plugin browser notification. When they click install plugin, what is gonna happen is that the payload is gonna be executed. And here we are, we can, we can check it out. We can see that we get a notification once the, the notification has been displayed. In other words, when this is displayed, and we will get notified when the person click on that notification. And finally, you can combine, a, in this case, Metaxploit. So we can try to perform a reverse TCP, you know, in other words, a, a backdoor to have shell access to the victim, to the, to the victim's computer. And then you can do whatever you want. You can try to perform a, I don't know, escalation privilege. You can try to, to perform a pivoting whatever whatever you want. How to do it? So as I mentioned, first we need to make sure there's an a RPC communication between Metaxploit and um, Beef. So just click on, type this, you know, load MSGRPC, the, the IP, the username and password that has been used, and then use um, Metaxploit as usual, you know. So in this case, I'm gonna uh, uh, prepare all this, uh, you know, set the, the specific, the target IP, the payload, uh, send the exploit, right? And obtain the, TC, the reverse TCP without any issue. Now, of course, a, the payload can also, the payload that was generated with Metaxploit can also be uploaded into the web server and we can send a fake notification and generate, a, I'm sorry, and execute that, a, that a backdoor, you know, that, that instruction to start a backdoor on the browser victim, and you're gonna see on your meta exploit that someone finally, um, you know, unfortunately, by the dust, and now you will be able to have a shell access to the victim computer. And finally, persistent. This is important to do. If if the if the victim closed the browser, then the connection most likely will be lost. Or if the victim closed the uh, the tab, the connection will be lost. But there are some techniques. One of them is to use a man in the browser attack to try to keep a persistent. So it's extremely simple. Just go to the persistent section, man in the browser and execute it. Simple as that. And that's it. I don't know, uh, Tyron, if there's any question. Any question, guys? I am here. I'm not seeing any questions <laughs> just yet. Um, yeah, so there was a question about how does Beef help you in your reporting phase? Okay, so how Beef helps on the reporting phase? So I will say it will help a lot from the, um, you can take a screenshots, you can uh, obtain evidence, you know, show evidence that that, that type of activity was performed. You can, uh, uh, know about how far you were able to uh, reach, you know, on your uh, penetration testing effort. So it will give you, it will help you a lot from the evidence perspective, you know, to, to show what you're able to do. Of course, on the logs, you can, you can extract the logs and you can show, you know, your, uh, the company that hire, hire you that those attacks were performed without any issue. So again, it's from evidence perspective, it helps a lot. 
another question. I know the answer to this, but I'd love to hear it from you. Sure. Is, is this safe to use on the internet? Is it safe to use over the internet? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, so let, let me see if I understand it properly. So if it is safe to use beef over the internet to, to perform penetration testing. So from the legal perspective, you have to be very careful. Okay. In other words, make sure that if you are going to only allow connections to your uh, beef server from IPs from your victim, right? Because at the end, it's going to be exposed over the internet. Someone else could click on it that is outside of the scope of your penetration testing, right? Someone could forward that email to someone else that is not on that company. So please be very, very careful on the way you use Beef. Again, using your social ethical hacking hat uh, and be very careful. You know, getting in a legal issue is, is, could be very easy, unfortunately. So I will say that that would be my my position. You know, it, it's secure as, as long as you are able to control who can use your browser exploitation framework. Okay, there was um, a question about how do you trust the pen testing tools um, and ensure that the tools are malware themselves? Okay, well, that's a, a <laughs> an interesting question because we are using tools that could be used for good and tools that could be used for bad, okay? So I will say that if you want to use these tools and if you want to make sure that it, it doesn't have, it doesn't contain any malicious code, well, it, this is open source, you know, just get into the source code, try to get familiar with what it exactly does. Try to know, uh, you know, uh, what, what is going to happen when someone click on it. So. I will say that will be my advice because these could be tools that could be used for training purposes for cybersecurity specials, but also could be used by cyber, you know, cyber criminals to do bad things. Okay, uh, I see two more questions. Mm -hmm. I know the answers <laughs> <laughs> as well. Um, how much would this setup cost, and how do you defend against it? How much this setup cost? From the cost perspective, uh, man, this is open source. This is this is free. <laughs> this is all, all these tools that I mentioned. You know, the Kali, the browser exploitation framework, the social engineering toolkit, uh, even Endrock. You can use it uh, for free. So, from the cost perspective, is extremely extremely um, cost effective. Of course, you can increase the the effectiveness by paying, for example, using the, the not the free version of Metaxploit. It will have a trying to connect. A, a, Tyrone, can, can you hear me? Hello. Hello, can you, you hear me? Kind of froze up. Yeah, you just kind of froze up. Yeah, for some reason, for a bit. there was some issue with the connection. Um, yeah, it we'll yeah, edit it happens. Once in a while, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's, a, that's the way internet works. So I don't know, uh, uh, what was the last part that you were able to listen when I was trying to explain that? Um, so, so a couple of questions. So we, we know that it's free. I mean, aside from if you want to buy a, a domain, that's mm -hmm. similar to your target's domain. You may have to pay for that. Yeah. Um, we missed the part of how you can defend against it. And then there was a question about acquiring the slides. Oh, okay. So uh, how can you defend against this type of attacks? So um, so first of all, I will say that the number one tool that you can use is security awareness. Make sure that your employees knows about what is social engineering. They know how to detect phishing messages via SMS, via email, uh, via phone call. You know, that they, they are very, very familiar. Make sure to run this type of penetration testing uh, at least, I will say at least once per year as a minimum, you know, because people tend to forget about this type of thing. So the, the, it, that's why it is important to try to do it, you know, in a frequently frequent way. Um, so I, I, definitely awareness is, is the, the number one, because at the end, what we're trying to exploit, we're trying to exploit humans. We're trying to hack humans. As you can see, we are not exploiting a, 
a vulnerability on the web server. We're, we are ex exploiting a vulnerability of people because they trust on emails. They don't check uh, details, you know, so they could easily, uh, you know, fail on the trick of clicking or downloading a, an attachment. And regarding the slides, uh, yeah, of course, I can, I can definitely uh, uh, share it with you guys. That's not an issue. Just remember to use right, so, it for good, you know, that's all. <laughs> yes, for sure. Don't get yourself in trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, we will post the video um, to the same place that we used to register um, on the Cover 6 website. We can also embed those slides there mm -hmm. as well. Um, we are out of time, so I want to thank yeah. you all for coming. I want to thank the team for helping me put this together. And of course, we want to thank Juan for the great presentation. And we definitely look forward to having you again this year. Yeah, thank you very Sometime much. Sometime very, very soon. Yeah, <laughs> this was really, really good. Thank you very much, Aaron. All right. Thank, so, thank you for, for the opportunity. Yeah, no problem. You have any? You have any parting words for the group? Well, I will say just uh, keep a curious mind, guys. Keep a curious mind. Try to learn as much as you can. Practice a lot. Cybersecurity is an interesting universe. You can learn a lot. You can create a very successful career. Um, you know, th this is, if you feel passionate about it, you know, don't stop, continue learning. This is a, a, a very interesting area of information technology where you can develop a very successful and interesting career. All right. Those, couldn't have said it better myself. Um, <laughs> thank you all uh, for coming out. Uh, we will see you all next week. There will be a follow-up message to everyone that has links to contact Juan. Um, so see you all next week. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.